just a little bit of background. Um, the machinery division covers the following uh, directives, machinery directive, low voltage, electromagnetic compatibility directive, pressure equipment, ATEX. We also carry out pure inspections on a, a national basis and, and across Europe. Uh, we will provide countrywide seminars uh, either at a, a designated facility or we can could do in-house seminars, whichever suits. Um, we're also the, the technical appointed technical advisors for the PPMA, the Process Packaging Machinery Association. Um, just moving on, we're going to be looking at the machinery directive in relationship to machines. Now, obviously, the directive does not distinguish between uh, a machine that sits on a table to a whole production line. Everything comes within the scope of the directive. And in, in the UK, we, we have two sets of regulations that we should be aware of. We have the, the Machinery Directive, 2006-42-EC. And that really lays down a requirement on the manufacturer that he has to comply with before he can place his machine or equipment for use on the European market. And, and that therefore applies mainly to new machinery getting produced or maybe some second-hand machinery coming from outside of Europe. However, when, when the, these directives were being developed, somebody in Europe said, well, what about all the equipment that we have in Europe at the present moment? So the European uh, Commission got together and, and come out with the Work Equipment Directive, which covers the use of existing equipment. And we place that into our legislation as the Provision and Use of Work Equipment Regulations, 1998. So you, you, by first sight, it looks as if we have one set of regulations for the manufacturer and another set of regulations for the user. And if that was the case, life would be a lot easier. But there is a lot of overlaps between these two pieces of legislation, i.e. one simple one is Regulation 10 of PURE says, as the user, if you were going to put a piece of equipment for use in your, your employment, then it must comply to all CE uh, applicable directives. So therefore, the user now has a, a requirement to actually make sure the equipment they are getting is not only CE marked, but it is CE marked correctly. So, the Machinery Safety Directive, this, this is the directive that we, we're going to speak about most of this afternoon. How do we comply? What do we need to do? And the idea is to try and take a machine like that where, you know, the guarding was perhaps not as good as it should be in the past, and there may be other hazards, up to a machine where we now have, you know, adequate guarding and safety precautions in place, you know, the interlocks to, to ensure that if people go through a gate that the machine stops and is placed in a safe manner. So this is the, one of the main concepts of the Machinery Directive. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the only defence you have in the, in the directives is that you've used due diligence. You, Europe doesn't identify or recognise uh, reason to be practicable. So <clears throat> when you're looking at being compliant with the directives, then you have to look at it from a due diligence point of view. So th this is affectionately known as, as the HSE horse, and I'm probably showing my age, but if John Wayne was going to make a cowboy film on Blackpool Beach uh, and he was going to ride a horse, this is what he'd be covered by now to demonstrate due diligence. So you know, the, the, the directive does refer, it goes through, to looking at foreseeable use and foreseeable misuse. So we have to look at every element of a machine's safety and phase of life. So significance of CE marking. Well, we have, we have 18 CE marking directives, what we call new approach directives. The benefit is if you comply with one of those directives or any applicable directives, you now have a market of over 500 million people that you can sell to. And, and that is growing by day by day. Uh, maybe not the biggest area in population, but certainly from the last uh, records in uh, GDR, we were the, the most sort of affluent society. 
implement implications. Uh, these are legal requirements in the UK. If you don't comply, worst case scenario, there is a possibility of a jail sentence. Or, more realistically, it will be removing your product from the market or being unable to sell your product or the bad publicity that goes with it. And the requirements are basically documentational, that you have complied with the directive and you have the documentation to prove or endorse that you have done this compliance, carried out this compliance. So, <clears throat> what I've done here is I've listed four of the main directives that are associated with machinery. And probably if you're listening to this, you, you will be affected by, by one or all of these directives. <coughs> Pardon me. The machinery directive. That is the directive we're going to concentrate on, and we'll go into a little bit more depth on that as we go through uh, the next uh, period of time. Um, low voltage directive, this looks at everything that's operating at 50 volts up to 1,000 volts. So if your machine plugs into a socket or is a, a 415 volt uh, supply, then it will come under the low voltage directive. This directive is being reviewed at the present moment to re to remove the lower limit of 50 volts. So if it's got any electrical equipment on, then it will come under the low voltage directive. But that amendment hasn't been adopted yet. We then have the EMC directive, the Electromagnetic Compatibility Directive. And this looks at equipment giving out or being susceptible to radio frequencies. So, you know, you stood on a production line near the control point, you take out your mobile phone and make a call, and the computer goes off and all the production line stops. That EMC directive is to reduce that occurrence or, you know, operating a machine and somebody's tele-changing channel on a street over the road. Um, we then have the pressure equipment directive that looks at pipe work that has a pressure of more than 0.5 of a bar. So on any machines then you would be looking at do you comply with the pressure equipment directive as well. Um, the, the pressure equipment directive for machinery isn't that onerous at times because there are exclusions within the pressure equipment directive if you are complying to the machinery directive. <clears throat> now, a directive, if we look at that, they each have an individual or a unique number. But a directive has no bearing on you know, anybody listening to this uh, webinar. What a directive does is it, it, it places a responsibility on the member state to actually introduce that directive into their legal systems, which they have done. And the UK has brought these directives into our law by the use of an issue of regulations. And, and in the UK, we've made it a criminal offence uh, punishable by fines and imprisonment not to comply. Now, here's where you might lose the, the level paying field because um, there may not be the same stringent requirements in other countries. They will all have put the, the directives into their legislation, but how they then enforce that legal requirement is, is up to the member states. So that, that could be different. And so these are the four directives uh, introduced into our regulations. So the machinery directive becomes the supply of machinery in bracket safety regulations with a statutory instrument number of 1597. Again, that is unique for that regulation. The low voltage directive becomes the electrical equipment in bracket safety regulations and so on and so on. So that's the legal entity for, for, for us in the UK. And now, if we look at the machinery directive and try and break that down a little bit more, um, the first thing any directive does, and this is constant across the directives, is it actually has a scope of what the, the directive covers. Uh, and if we look at the, the scope for the machinery directive, it's machi machinery, interchangeable equipment, safety components, lifting accessories are included in the scope, Change ropes and webbings come within the scope of the machinery directive. 
removable mechanical transmission devices and partly completed machines. And what I'd like to do now is just take a, a little brief sentence on each of those definitions within the scope of the directive. Firstly, what is machine? <clears throat> An assembly fitted with or intended to be fitted with a drive system other than direct applied manual or human effort. And the reason behind this is that if I'm applying manual effort and a hazard arises, if I take that manual effort off, then the hazard should go away. Um, consistent of linked parts or components, at least one of which moves and which are joined together for a specific application. And, and, and that last sentence is fairly important because you, know, you could say, well, an electric motor, is it a machine? Well, it has linked parts and components, at least one of which moves. But from a manufacturing point of view, if I don't put a gear or a pulley on the end of the, the drive shaft, then it will not have a specific application. Therefore, from my point of view, I would suggest that an electric motor is not a machine. So, you know, it, it is looking at the detail of what, what is said in the directive. So if we have a, a machine like this that is driven by animal, uh, animal power, then it would not come under the, the scope of the directive. Carry on, I don't know, there seemed to be a little bit of a glitch there. But. Um, then we go on to the, the next definition, uh, which looks at an assembly machines and or partly completed machinery, which in order to achieve the same end are arranged and controlled to function as an integral whole. Now, one of the, the, the examples of that is a, a robot manufacturer. He can't see he mark his robot because he can't comply with all the aspects of the directive. So he can give the robot what's called a declaration of incorporation to say that I, I've complied as much as I can but then somebody will then build a, a perimeter fence around it, put the necessary safety on that perimeter fence for, for ingress, and that person will then be responsible for CE marking that robot as a cell because it will function as an integral whole. Or you could be looking at a bottling plant or, or any line where the machinery all works uh, together. So if we take a machine and we add some control and say we're going to add some automation, a robot, then although the machine may be CE compliant and marked and the robot may be CE compliant, what we would have to do is treat this as a complex assembly and CE mark it as such. The next definition is interchangeable equipment. And it, everybody should be aware that the machinery directive or any directive is trying to cover any aspect of where, where that machinery or where that equipment is used. So it's not just factory use, it's, it's across all aspects and all fields. And, and this, this scope definition was mainly aimed at, at the agricultural market where you know, you, you're looking at you have a base tractor and you're going to add different equipment on the back or the front of that tractor and thereby that can alter the safety or the function of that tractor. So what this is, interchangeable equipment means a device which after placing into service with machinery or tractor is assembled with that machinery or tractor by the operator himself in order to change its function or attribute a new function insofar as this equipment is not a tool. So if we had an injection molding machine, if we were just going to change the tools, then those tools don't become interchangeable equipment. So if we take that example where we've added a, a ploughing equipment to the, the tractor, could that make the tractor more susceptible to turning over or, or tipping over? So that, that interchangeable equipment has to be CE marked to make sure it is compatible with that use for that tractor. Lifting operators <coughs> whose only source is directly applied manual effort is included in the scope of the directive because obviously if I'm apply applying that manual effort and 
I take it off, then there's a possibility that that the load could fall on somebody's head or my head. So that is included in the directive. Uh, lifting equipment, an assembly of link parts or components, again, at least of what's one of which moves, which are going, joined together, intended for lifting loads, and whose only power sources, direct applied human effort, are included in the directive. Lifting accessory means a component or equipment not attached to the lifting machinery, but allowing the, the load to be held, which is placed between the machinery and the load, or on the load itself. So we're looking at hooks and anything of, of that nature. So if we're lifting, then that would become classed as a machine or within the scope of the, of the machinery directive. And again, you know, and a lot of people don't realise this, that uh, the machinery directive also covers integral parts of the loads, <coughs> which are independently placed on the market. Slings, ropes, Anything that's intended to be used for a lifting operation should come CE Mark. So in theory, if we lend to our local DIY shop um, and bought a, a, a length of rope to use as a lifting device, then it should be CE Mark. <clears throat> I don't think it happens very often. And th th this next definition is probably one of the most contentious definitions. I mean, I don't know whether everybody is aware, but the machinery directive changed at the beginning of last year. And one of the issues with the old directive was that it didn't really specify what a safety component was. It, it just talked in vague terms. So what they've tried to do here is, in, with the introduction of the the, the uh, modified directive actually is to to make some sort of definitions of of what is a safety component, uh, and these are the three definitions from the directive. A safety component is something that serves to fulfil a safety function. Fine, no problem. Which is independently placed on the market, so you can go and buy it independently. It doesn't come as part of a machine or anything. But this last one where the failure and or the malfunction of which endangers the safety of persons. Now that seems to open up a whole new raft of equipment that now may need to have CE marks on them. You know, if, if we take a, a lid and we put a, a strut, a, a pressurised strut on that, that lid, now if I put my head in to have a look at anything and that, the seal on that pressurised strut breaks, or bursts, then it could fall on my head. So are we looking now at pneumatic hydraulic struts all being CE marked in their own right? Um, if we look at non-return valves, you know, is that providing a safety function? Therefore, does it now have to be a CE marked non-return valve? Uh, and what they would have done with the introduction of the, the directive is they've actually added an annex where they've put an indicative list of what they class as safety components. <clears throat> and by saying it's indicative, they are just examples, they are not exhaustive. But the first one, extraction systems. An extraction system now has to be CE marked. So if we work in a factory and we're going to put a bit of ventilation or extraction in, we will have to now ask our ventilation extraction contractors to provide us with a CE mark for that. And the second one is, is probably one of the most um, eyebrow-raising ones, is guards. Uh, and protection devices are now classed as a safety device or a safety component. So if I've got a guard in my factory on a machine and I damage that guard and go out to get another one, I now have to get that one with a CE mark and with a declaration of conformity. So I can no longer just change a guard or remove and renew a guard um, you know, from the workshop because somebody is going to have to take the responsibility of actually making sure that guard is CE marked. And, and that is creating a, a lot of issues throughout the, the machinery uh, industry. Um, and, and then the rest are, are, are fairly straightforward. Control devices for calling lifting appliances, etc., and default devices, 
um, pressure mats, detection and presence of people, light curtains. I mean, we'd expect them to come CE marked anyway. Uh, safety belts and seat harnesses, they are now in the indicative list, so they now come under the machinery directive, and it actually states hydraulic non-return valves. And obviously, if you're looking at hydraulic non-return valves, then you would also be looking at pneumatic non-return valves. So these are some of the, the safety devices that we would now have to have with CE marks on if we were going out to buy them now. And obviously, again, when we go back to Pure, um, we would be in bother if we didn't get the CE mark one and then something went wrong with it. And there are some other scenarios that are uh, uh, explained within the directive that you might come across in, in your working role. Um, and the first one is if you are creating a complex assembly by interlinking a series of existing machines, you are in effect creating something new on the European market. Therefore, whoever is carrying out that work must ensure that the whole assembly complies with the directive regardless of the age of the, of the machines that we're looking at. And I, I think one of the things to be aware there is if you are looking at modifying some existing lines, it is pointed out early on in the contract who is going to be taking responsibility for the CE marking of that, that contract because it could come down to a, a contractual uh, element. If you're altering the, the function or performance of a machine or complex assembly, as far as the directive is concerned, you are again creating something new and must ensure that the directive is complied with. So <clears throat> if I was, I had a line making fish fingers or packing fish fingers, and I was going to take that line and speed it up to pack more fish fingers, obviously the existing guarding might not now be sufficient uh, rigidity to stop the fish fingers flying off. So if I was taking it out of the intended parameters of, of that, that, that machine, then I would have to CE mark it again. If the functional performance are not altered, this can be classed as a repair and no other action is required apart from risk assessment and compliance with PURE. So if we're just changing like for like, taking one robot out and putting another robot in, then all we have to do is make sure that we record it under PURE uh, and, and, and that's is all we need to do. However, if we were going to take the opportunity to put a bigger or a faster robot in, and again, we were taking it out of the outside the original parameters, then we would have to CE mark the, 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 the cell again. And what, what's happened is they have uh, extended the exemptions in the directive, and these are just the, the, the new exemptions. Means of transport uh, now includes trailers, Household appliances have been taken out of the machinery directive and placed in the low voltage directive. There was always this issue that if you took an electric lawnmower on a dry day, the, chance that the main hazard was you would cut your toe off, so it would come under the machinery directive. And on a wet day, the main hazard was you'd electrocute yourself, so it could then come under the low voltage directive, which was a silly sort of situation. So they've taken all household appliances now out of the machinery directive, and place them into the uh, low voltage directive. So, in theory, we can't get a washing machine now because it's not a machine. Uh, IT equipment's been taken out, audio, visual, you know, office machinery, photocopiers have moving parts, but is there any real hazard? Very little, so they've all gone into the low voltage directive as well. Uh, circuit breaker switches, low voltage and high voltage switch gear, and as we were talking about earlier, motors of all type have now been removed out of the machinery directive and placed into the low voltage directive. So if we've got any motors that we're going to buy off the shelf, make sure that they are the declaration of conformity complies to the low voltage directive and not the machinery directive. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and this is something that, that, that people miss. And a lot of the directive is, is you know, there's certain grey areas, but this is fairly black and white. And it says that these regulations also apply to in-house machinery, where the manufacturer of the relevant machinery himself puts that machinery into service, or having imported machinery from a country or territory outside the EEA puts that machinery into service. So as far as the directive is concerned, if I am going to take a machine, build it in my own premises, only ever use it for myself, there is no distinction. You still have to CE mark it, issue a declaration of conformity to yourself, and ensure it complies with all, all the machinery requirements. Low voltage and EMC directives are slightly different. What they say is that you have to comply with the directive, but you don't have to CE mark the, the actual equipment. But the machinery directive is fairly specific on that. You do have to do that. So if you've got an in-house machine that you're going to modify and change the function or performance, although you're not selling it, you still should CE mark it. And if you're importing machinery from outside the EEA, which is the European Economic Area, then again, you need to make sure that there are uh, European agents or somebody in Europe who is responsible for the CE marking of that equipment. It can be CE marked by somebody outside of the EEA, but it's always worthwhile to check that there is somebody in the EEA who is taking that responsibility. <coughs> and there has to be a responsible person. This, this is the word of the directive. There has to be a responsible person appointed. Uh, the manufacturer can be the responsible person, or if he doesn't feel he's competent to do that, he can appoint an authorised representative. And that person must carry out a risk assessment. Uh, and strangely enough, that was never asked for uh, in, in the directives that were previous to this one. So this is fairly new, asking for a risk assessment. And what it says is... <coughs> The risk assessment should be carried out in order to determine the health and safety requirements which apply to the machinery and have they been met. And the manufacturer or his authorised representative must determine the limits of the machinery which include, as we've said before, intended use and any reasonably foreseeable misuse thereof. So that, that is one of the, the crystal balls that we have to look at. Uh, and I'm sure when the people manufactured this dried on lawnmower they weren't envisaging anybody cutting his hedge with it <clears throat> but you see that's what we have to look at foreseeable misuse and the downside is in the UK non-compliances could result in prosecution and penalties on a summary conviction of a fine not to exceed the statutory maximum which is £20,000 and or 12 months imprisonment, or on conviction of an indictment, an unlimited fine, and or two years imprisonment. Uh, and we asked the solicitor what, what the, the difference was there, and a summary conviction would be something that's dealt with at a magistrate's court. Uh, a conviction of an indictment would be something that's dealt with at a Crown Court. Um, again, you know, there's nobody that I know have gone to prison for incorrectly CE marking their machines as of yet but there is always that possibility the other thing they've introduced is because when they introduced the new directive at the beginning of last year the European Commission said that member states may, should make it more dissuasive not to comply so where before there was a, a paragraph about you must supply the documentation in a time commensurate with its importance. They've now said if you don't do that, there is a, a monetary penalty for that now. So if asked to produce a technical file and we don't do it in the time specified, then it could be a £20,000 fine. Um, again, operating instructions, it could be another 20000 So we could very, very soon start uh, sort of racking up a, a fair amount of money on that. So it does make it more important to make sure that the documentation is there and available. So if we look at the machinery directive, and, and the, the whole essence be, be behind new approach directives is what we call the essential health and safety requirements. 
maybe called slightly different in different directives. In the low voltage directives, they're called the, the essential safety requirements, but basically the same thing. And the, this is a wish list of what you have to do as the manufacturer, or if you're the user, what you have to check that the manufacturer has done. Uh, and, and there's a list of questions, but the, 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 they're not prescriptive. They're very much open to interpretation. You know, I'm not going to go through them all. They're split into six sections. Section one is general and applies to all machinery, so that has to be filled in for every machine. And then we have sections two to six, which look at machinery in specific environments. Um, if you look in the general, 1.21 is starting, and it says the machine shall start safely. And that really is all it says. It's up to the manufacturer or the designer to ensure that this happens. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to touch on a, a couple of the sort of more interesting ones, if you want. Um, again, the first essential health and safety requirement, 1.12, asks us to carry out a risk assessment. First, we must identify all the hazards. That is anything that has the potential to cause harm. So we start with a blank piece of paper from a designer's point of view and say, right, let's list all the hazards. And then we must assess the risks. That is the likelihood of the person or persons coming into contact with the hazard and how much damage it would cause, whether it's going to be a scratch or a bruise or whether it's going to be a loss of limb. This is another one, and I've put this in to basically look at the the, the way that the the theory and the thought processes with machinery and, and European safety. This is stability, and it says machinery and its components must be designed and constructed that they are stable enough for use without risk of overturning, falling, or unexpected movement. That is the same as the, what was in the, the previous directive. This has been added, the second sentence. This requirement also applies during transportation assembly, dismantling, scrapping, and any other action involving the machinery. So what's happened now is we've actually got a cradle-to-grave directive. Although the, the CE time period lasts for 10 years, from a design and manufacture point of view, they now have to look at it from a complete life cycle. They, just, they, they do not require to look at it for a 10-year period. They have to look at it from sort of inception to scrapping and the instruction manuals and things like that should reflect that that life cycle another of the essential health and safety requirements that have changed is that guards must be securely held in place uh, must protect against ejection or falling of materials and objects and then it goes to say that fixed guards must be fixed with systems that can be only opened with a tool and it says that a, you know, a tool is something that is not an everyday uh, appliance. And this is the, 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 the one that really is catching a lot of people out, is their fixings must remain attached to the guard when the guard is removed. So every guard now, every fixed guard, has to have retained fixings. So every machine that has been made or produced to the, the previous directive will now have to be modified. So if you're buying anything and it has guards on, those guards have to have retained fixings. And where possible, guards must be incapable of remaining in position without their fixings. And certain small sort of changes to the instructions. Um, the directive said that uh, the instructions must be produced in the language of the intended user. This has been changed to say, right, all machinery must be accompanied with the instructions in an official community language, which there are something like 23. All languages of the member state into which it's been placed on the market. And the word original must appear on this language version. A translation must be provided by the manufacturer or his authorised representative or by the person bringing the machinery into that language area. These instructions must be marked with the word translation. So there is no legal requirement. Now, this, this directive removes the legal requirement for the instructions to be in the language of the intended user. 
Because if I was buying a machine from Germany, which obviously is a, an official community language, I can produce that instruction manuals in that language. I can then say to the person who's bringing it into the UK, your job is to translate these instructions. The manufacturer now has no legal requirements to do the translation. So if you are buying machines or ordering machines, please ensure that it is in the contract. Um, <clears throat> just to go on a little bit further, um, I'm not used to doing these. I'm used to questions as we go. Um, but looking at when we do look at machines or when we're modifying machines or when we're manufacturing them or even if we're just maintaining them, then if we do have any issues that we need to, to address, then what we need to look at is the EN standards, the European normal normalization standards. And I don't know how many people are using these, but the, the issue is is that what it says in the directive and referred to in PUA is that machinery manufactured in conformity with specified published European harmonised standards will be presumed to comply with the essential health and safety requirements covered by those standards. So if I'm looking at guarding and, and reach distances, if I go to what the standard says, then I have met my obligations. I don't have to do any more. All I have to do is what the standard says. And, and I've just put a, a few little sort of slides on the standards. Uh, A-type standards apply to all machines. There's actually only two A-type standards now. Um, and one is, the, the main one is one called 12100, which looks at basic safety design of machinery. B-type standards are, I call them the when used standards. So if I'm going to put an emergency stop on, there is an emergency stop standard 13850, which will tell me what I need to do. If I'm going to put guards on, there are various guarding standards. If I'm going to put electricity into it, it there's an EN standard 60204. And then we have C-type standards, where, which are specific for a machinery type. So if I'm building a robot, there is a C-type standard for robots. I need to just check that my robot meets that C-type standard. Because again, C-type standard, gives you presumption of compliance to the directive. I mean, there, there is a bit of discussion going on whether some type C type standards actually do give you full compliance to the directive, but that hasn't been resolved yet. So we start off with the A type standards, we move these under the B type standards, and then the C type standard or the machine specific standard should incorporate the best parts of the the relevant standards that, that are attributed to that particular machine. Um, if you're looking at standards, nearly all EN standards are linked to a particular directive. For the machinery directive, you're looking somewhere in this region of about 650 linked standards, but, but out of that, there'll only be sort of 15 to, to 30 that you would come across on a regular basis. Examples, B-type standards, 953, selection of guarding, manufacturing of guards, 13857, the positioning of guards to protect upper and lower limbs. Um, this is just one I put in because this is just something that I, I don't really understand. This standard establishes values for safety distances to prevent danger zones being reached by the upper limbs of persons of three years of age and above. <clears throat> and it also provides safety distances to prevent danger zones being reached by the lower limbs of persons of 14 years of age and above. And I don't know why we differentiate with age. I, I've, I've never understood that. Um, and I don't think we employ a lot of three-year-olds now at the present moment. Um, but, however, that, that is the scope of that, that standard. And it, it gives you certain charts which helps you. So if you had a a danger, a height of the danger zone. We had a robot that was swinging round, which was you know a meter high, and we had a, a reach from the the fence to the robot arm of a meter. Then, if we look across that chart, it says the height of the protective structure has to be 1.4 meters high. And then, if we look at there, there's a little note saying protective structures lower than 14 
100 millimeters should not be used without additional safety me measures. So there's a lot of information in the New Zealand standards. Again, a European arm is 850 millimeter long. So if we're going to put any guarding on or tunnel guarding, if we put it less than 850 millimeters, then we've, we've wasted our money. It, it doesn't comply with what the standard says. So all, all of this information is in these standards and they're all based on the European average person. And here's some samples of C-type standards. Um, again, out of the 650, there's probably about 220 C-type standards for, for particular specific machines. Step two, after we comply with the essential health and safety requirements, is put together our technical construction file, which is the documentational support that we've co correctly CE marked our machine or piece of equipment. The technical file has to be kept for 10 years, and it is really the only way to demonstrate that you have complied with the essential health and safety requirements and the other provisions of the directives. And by the way, just to be ensured that it's there for the manufacturer's security as well. So if anybody modifies one of his machines and subsequently somebody gets injured, then um, he's got a, a file that shows exactly how that machine was manufactured. Um, that's the declaration of conformity. Um, it's a standard. All, all of the information required is in the annex of the directive. The only difference is that we now have to put on the name and of the address of the person in the community who is authorised to compile a technical file, if different from a book. So a technical file for every piece of machine has to reside in the European Union because that person has to be, that address has to be a European address. Um, that's the CE mark. It does have specific um, dimensions. And just very quick, um, just to let you know that things are changing from a functional safety point of view, we had an EN standard 954, which was deleted last uh, November, December last year. And these two standards are actually going to be replacements for that 954. Um, and what, what they allow you to do, which 954 never did, was to allow you to put safety through software. So there are new sort of two-wire systems that you can put in with functional blocks, which are very flexible. You can add in another function block, plug in a, a safety device. Obviously, they only work for complex machines because the hardware at the front end of, of that system is fairly expensive. And, and, and that is a system of actually trying to uh, analyse which one of those two standards that should be used in which circumstances. 13849, the direct replacement for 954. Uh, where 954 had categories, 13849 introduces performance levels. And it looks at the component parts as well now, not just at the type of wiring or piping. It looks at what the integrity of the components you're using. And every manufacturer of safety components is now having to provide data of what's called the MTTD, which is the time to dangerous failure. It's a four-stage approach, perform a risk assessment, identify the risks and all allocate a performance level, devise a system architecture, i.e. what components you're going to use, what's the integrity of those components, and then validate that design. And that is fairly complex and is fairly time-consuming for, for people who have not uh, been introduced to that yet. And there is a risk graph which is similar to 954, only there's a few more um, variations. Um, and these are our one-day seminars that we do around the country that are coming up um, where people can come along and we give a day's introduction into CE, pure um, standards, risk assessment. Obviously, in, in less than an hour, there's not a lot you can actually say. 
and we also have the first or the only that we know of uh, endorsed university certificate in machinery safety where the, the Teesside University actually moderate and award uh, a, a part degree in machinery safety. Uh, and later this year we will be uh, introducing two new university courses which are one in electrical machinery safety and one in the functional machinery safety. And that basically is the end.